to be with you today. My name is Brett Olson, and I serve here on staff at Bethany. And it's my privilege to be bringing the word today, this, this morning. And uh, I just want to spend a few moments today creating a picture of what life would be like for the disciples following Jesus' resurrection. We're spending these summer months here at Bethany walking through the Great Commission, Jesus' instructions to his disciples before ascending into heaven and leaving them with the Holy Spirit. And we see this Great Commission defined by three distinct ideas. The idea of the dichotomy between worship and doubt, the idea of Jesus' authority, and the call that he places on each of our lives to be a disciple who makes disciples. And I want to spend our time beginning today to unpack this idea of the call that Jesus places on our lives to be a disciple who makes disciples, to go and make disciples. And in order to do that, we're going to be examining the lives of two men this, today. One we know very well, and one who's kind of become synonymous with the Christian faith and the gospel message. The other, though, is not quite as known. And both have a lot to teach us about what this call to make disciples is really all about. But before we look deeper into their stories, let me set the stage for you a little bit as we kind of orient ourselves to what's going on in the story of faith. The disciples have left the mountainside where once again they've met with Jesus after he has resurrected. And they've received this commissioning from him. Jesus calls his disciples to go, and initially they're kind of confused. Where exactly do they go? What exactly do they do? But in this great commission, Jesus also promises them and us that he will never leave us or forsake us. Jesus has never left us abandoned. He's not left us to fend for ourselves, but he will be with us always until the very end of the age. And in the same way God has sent Jesus into the world, Jesus has sent his Holy Spirit into the world to provide that connection with him. And once the disciples received this gift of the Holy Spirit, they were truly set on fire for the cause. They went out and began teaching, but they not only taught, but they taught with passion and authority. They went out and began to heal people and cast out demons. For this group of disciples, they must have been reminded of the words that Jesus spoke to them earlier before his crucifixion and his resurrection. He said, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing, and they will do even greater things than these. Word of this teaching and what these disciples were doing began to explode in Jerusalem, and soon thousands of people were saying they were followers of the way, as it was now being called, this Jesus movement. Even Jewish priests were beginning to follow. All the Spirit was doing, however, did not come without its challenges. The Sanhedrin, the Jewish religious and ruling establishment, realized quickly that this was more than just a band of zealots. This was more than just word on the street. This Jesus problem had become more than just a problem. It was becoming a movement. It was becoming a revolution. And it was moving at a rate that they were powerless to stop. So the Sanhedrin began arresting these new followers of Jesus and putting them in prison or putting them to death. And we see one of these accounts of these moments in the book of Acts with the stoning of a Christ follower named Stephen. And of all the Sanhedrin, there was no person more committed to the cause of quelching this Jesus movement than Saul of Tarsus. The book of Acts tells us that Saul was there at Stephen's stoning watching and approving of what happened there. Acts, 8, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 to 3 tells us, on that day, a great persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. Godly men buried Stephen and mourned deeply for him. But Saul began to destroy the church, going from house to house, he dragged off both men and women and put them in prison. 
Well, when Saul of Tarsus was on your tail, that was cause for great fear. But even when this Jesus movement appeared to be floundering, enduring persecution from all sides, the spirit of God was at work advancing the good news of Jesus. The believers were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria, but it seems like wherever they went, people responded to this message. And the people who began to receive this message of strength and freedom were the people least likely, you would think, to receive this message of Jesus. They were Samaritans who were historically the bitter rivals of the Jews. There was a sorcerer named Simon and an Ethiopian and an Ethiopian dignitary. All unlikely converts to the way, but all received this message of the gospel and immediately their lives were transformed. Their lives were changed. And they began going back and telling their own communities about the transformative power of Jesus in their life. Which leads me to the question that I want to examine today. What is the call that Jesus presents before us? What is the call that Jesus presents before us? As we seek those answers, let's begin to examine the response of these two men as they hear an unlikely call from Jesus. Our story begins in the book of Acts, chapter 9, verse 1. It reads in this way. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. Now there are a few things that I want us to stop and observe here. As the focus of this narrative Luke is writing shifts back to Saul of Tarsus. And the first is a small word that I missed uh, the first few times that I read it uh, this week. And it's that word that the Bible says, meanwhile. Meanwhile is a word that challenges us to think back to all that's going on with, while this gospel is being received with passion and fervor by the Samaritans and the people outside of the Jewish community. That at the same time, meanwhile, there were those within the Jewish community who were not receiving this message so readily. While the people outside of the Jewish community were receiving this message with joy, there was also a group who were continuing to view this Jesus movement as an attack and, a, and an affront on their very way of life. And their response to that movement will be dictated by that. The text tells us that Saul was breathing out these murderous threats against the disciples. In other words, his whole life, his whole purpose, his whole calling was consumed by this desire to not only prevent the gospel from spreading, but to destroy it entirely. He was not content with simply driving these followers of Jerusalem out of Jerusalem. His goal was to end this perceived rebellion altogether, once and for all. Luke tells us later in the book of Acts that Saul's commitment to stamp out the Jesus movement was very strong. He tells us in Acts 26, verses 9 to 12, as Paul is arguing his case before Herod Agrippa, Paul says it this way, I too was convinced that I ought to do all that was possible to oppose the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's just what I did in Jerusalem. On the authority of the chief priests, I put many of the Lord's people in prison. And when, and when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. Many a time I went from one synagogue to another to have them punished and I tried to force them to blaspheme. I was so obsessed with persecuting them that I even hunted them down in foreign cities. And we see that that's exactly what Saul is doing here. He's leaving Jerusalem and going out into the foreign city of Damascus. Armed with this commissioning from the high priest, he sets out to continue his goal of exterminating the church. Saul and his band of vigilantes set out for the city of Damascus. 
and with the goal to purge the city of all the Christ followers there. And as I thought about that journey this week, I was reminded that the trip from Jerusalem to Damascus was no short journey. The trip was actually over 130 miles, in fact. If you were beginning a trip today outside of the door of our Greenland campus and said, I'm going to drive to Hartford, that's about the same distance that Saul would be traveling from Jerusalem to Damascus. It's about a two and a half hour car ride in today's terms, but of course Saul didn't have the same method of travel. He didn't have air conditioning. It would have taken him much longer than it would today. He may have had a horse or camel, but many commentators actually believe that Saul made this journey on foot and it would take over two weeks to arrive there. So I want you to imagine being so deeply entrenched against something that you're willing to walk to Hartford, Connecticut to stop it. That's the level of zeal and fervor that Saul had to end this Jesus movement. So Saul would find himself on the road, going from town to town with the entire goal of finding out who these followers of Jesus were and dealing with them accordingly. And as Saul begins to reach his final destination, as his entourage begins to see the walls of the city in the distance, we see the next part of our story begin to unfold. Luke, the writer of the book of Acts, tells us in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, as he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, Why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Talk about a serious change of plans. If you've ever been on a long road trip like that, you know that things don't always go according to plan. You get off the highway to stop for dinner and the restaurant you plan on stopping at is closed or the gas station you plan on stopping at is miles off the highway. But those sorts of mild inconveniences are nothing in comparison to what Saul experiences here. On the side of the road approaching Damascus, Saul has a divine encounter with God himself. Suddenly a light flashes from the sky and terrified, Saul falls to the ground and hears a voice from the heavens saying, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me. This is a dramatic story. This man was supposed to be dead. He was said to be crucified and buried. There's a common belief at the time that his disciples had taken up the mantle and concocted this story that Jesus was raised from the dead. But now Jesus was speaking directly to him and his words have power and weight. Notice how Jesus begins this message to Saul. He says, why are you persecuting me? Now, Jesus was not on earth at this point. He's ascended into heaven at the Great Commission and he sent his Holy Spirit into the world. But he's accusing Saul here of persecuting him. When believers suffer at the hands of Saul, Jesus, who sent his Holy Spirit into the world, suffers alongside them as well. When we suffer today, Jesus suffers alongside us. Jesus himself is with us in our suffering, which should provide a great comfort to us. And while we may not have quite as dramatic a story as Saul, I'm sure that many of us have had our own divine encounters with Jesus, where it seems like everything we knew or everything we thought we knew about God is suddenly turned upside down. And the way that we respond when we're faced with these sorts of divine encounters has the potential to dramatically change our life and change the world. Saul has literally seen the light of 
everything he thought to be true, everything he had dedicated his whole life to uprooting, everything he spent his entire career working towards is turned completely and utterly upside down. There's nothing he could do that would prepare him for this. This is a reality that Saul would grow to understand as time went by. But as he's faced first on the ground, he's faced with the reality of everything he thought he knew has changed. And this Jesus, this Jesus who he had spent so much time persecuting was speaking directly to him. Let's look at Jesus' words continuing in verse six. He says, now get up and go into the city and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there, stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus, where for three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. Jesus not only speaks to Saul, but he tells him where to go next. Saul's entourage must have been equally terrified when they heard the voice and saw the light, but their fear must have turned to terror when they saw Saul rise from the ground and seemingly struck blind. Saul had quite literally been blinded by the light. Slowly, the group leads Saul by the hand into Damascus, where for three days his blindness continued, and he refused to eat or drink anything. Now, I think it can be easy to mistake this decision to avoid eating or drinking as some sort of fast. That Saul was so amazed by what had happened there that he goes into a time of fasting. And while this certainly could be the case, it's probably much more likely that this was a result of shock rather than any sort of spiritual decision. But you have to imagine as Saul's world was shrouded in darkness, that he's faced with reliving and replaying his decisions and Jesus' words over and over again in his mind's eye. And here in this dramatic moment between Jesus and Saul, there are a few things that we can discover about the call that God has placed on each of our lives. But the first thing we know is that Jesus is calling each of us to be his disciples. While Saul didn't have a full grasp on that reality yet, this is exactly what Jesus was doing. The call that Jesus places before us is to be his disciple. Now that term disciple is one that's often tossed around in Christian circles, but what exactly does that mean? Well, at its basic definition, the term disciple means student. When Saul was rising up in the ranks of the Sanhedrin, the religious elite, much of the reason that Saul was able to rise so quickly was because he was studying, he was a disciple under a man named Gamaliel. Later in the book of Acts, it tells us that Saul was born in Tarsus, but brought up in Jerusalem, where he studied under Gamaliel, who trained him in every aspect of religious life. Jesus is calling each one of us to be his disciple, to learn from him, to follow after him, to dedicate our whole lives to him. For Saul, this is a dramatic change in direction. The very man that Saul was so vehemently opposed to, the very man that Saul was speaking out against, the very man who Saul had made it his mission in the world to exterminate his followers, was now challenging him to live for him. It was a complete change in direction. But there are a few things about this divine encounter, this call to follow after Jesus from the story of Saul. The first thing we know is that our standing as a disciple has nothing to do with us. If you were making a list of everyone possible to be a disciple of Jesus, Saul of Tarsus would probably be pretty near the bottom of the list. There is nothing in him that wanted anything to do with Jesus. 
let alone follow him. But God's plans are greater than our own. God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And God wants each and every one of us to make that decision to follow him. Second, we know that our place as a disciple does not depend on us. There's nothing we can do to merit or earn our place among Jesus' disciples. The master chooses his disciple, not the other way around. There's nothing we can do to earn our place as a disciple that Jesus hasn't already done. Our job is to simply acknowledge our place as his follower. I accepted Christ when I was five years old. I'd grown up in church. I grew up in Sunday school. I sang all the songs. I knew all the stories. But still, there was something that wasn't fully clicking for me. That all changed in middle school when a small group leader invited me to attend a winter retreat with our youth group. The speaker there clearly explained Jesus' love for me in a way that I never fully understood before. From that point on, I rededicated my life to following after Jesus, to following after him. Not simply because I was taught to believe it or because I wanted to go to heaven, but because everything in me wanted to know him more. Everything in me wanted to love him more. Everything in me wanted to experience more of this life with him. But for those of us who have accepted that call, for those of us who acknowledge our new identity as disciples of Jesus, there can often be a question that arises after such a decision. And it's the question of now what? For those of us who've made this decision to follow Christ, I believe we can find those answers as we continue in our study in the book of Acts. Let's continue reading in chapter nine, verse 10. It says, in Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a, in a vision, Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place, hand, place his hands on him to restore his sight. Here, Luke introduces us to our second man in this story, a disciple living in Damascus named Ananias. Little is known about Ananias' origins or his faith story, though it is possible that Ananias was one of those early followers of Jesus who fled to Jerusalem after persecution from men like Saul. It is also possible that Ananias was one of those who was living in Damascus and heard the message from those who were scattered into Damascus after those days of persecution. And in Damascus, he became a follower of Jesus. Regardless of that background, the lack of focus seems to suggest that it isn't as important as what, he, as what he's being asked to do here. In a later retelling of his conversion in Acts 22, Luke tells us that Ananias was a, was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. Ananias was someone who was respected in the community for his commitment to the law and for the cause of the gospel. In other words, he was a faithful follower of Jesus. And Ananias too, like Saul, receives a vision from Jesus, telling him to go to the house of Judas on Straight Street, another follower of Jesus, where he will find a man named Saul of Tarsus. Though we will see that this request comes as a shock to Ananias, the visit doesn't come as a shock to Saul, who's had another vision where he's seen a man he was told was Ananias place his hands on him and restore his sight. This is an occurrence that will repeat itself throughout the book of Acts as things are confirmed through what's called a double dream. While Ananias responds to this dream in verse 13, he says, Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man. 
and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Now, it may be easy to condemn Ananias here for a lack of faith, but before we do, I think we need to put ourselves in the place of Ananias. While he had no personal or firsthand experience with Saul and his treatment of the followers of Jesus, word of Saul's actions has clearly spread. Ananias has no doubt heard reports from many people from all over the region who were harassed, arrested, and even reports of those who were killed at the hands of Saul. And perhaps even more concerning to him is that Ananias has heard that this man, Saul, is on his way to Damascus with authority from the chief priests in Jerusalem to arrest every Christ follower that he comes in contact with. So while Ananias certainly questions the word of Jesus here, does he not have a very appropriate reason to do so? And while we're not faced with the same sort of physical or bodily threat as Ananias was, I think this can often be our reaction when we hear the spirit prompting us to witness to people in our sphere of influence. If you're anything like me, you hear the spirit prompting you to witness to someone at your school, your work, or in your neighborhood. And is there not a pause in your spirit like there was for Ananias? Is there not a little bit of fear? At least for me, and I believe for Ananias, this feeling of fear arises when we consider the response of the other person to our message. For Ananias, there was a real fear that as soon as he got to the house on Straight Street, Saul of Tarsus would be lying in wait, ready to spring an attack. For us, well, the concern may be less concerned with our physical safety. We, ha we too have the same concerns about how someone might react or respond to the gospel message. Thoughts like, what if they think I'm weird? Or what if they get angry or offended? Or what if this damages my relationship with this person? Seem to rush to our mind. And if you're like me, this constant cycle of second guesses can leave us feeling too afraid to do anything at all. Well, for those of us who are feeling bogged down, by those feelings of fear today. The next verse put my mind at ease. It says, but the Lord said to Ananias, go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. The encouragement for us in this verse, the encouragement that may help you put your mind at ease as you think about having these sort of evangelistic conversations, is that it isn't up to you to do the saving. It isn't up to you to do the saving. It wasn't the job of Ananias to go to Saul and force him to repent and answer for his crimes. It wasn't the job of Ananias to determine whether Saul was worthy of receiving that gospel message. God has already determined that Saul was the man who was being prepared and equipped to bring his message to the Gentiles. God is the one who will force him to reckon with the mistakes of his past. And God is the one who has determined and outlined that there's a greater purpose here for Saul than Ananias or anyone else could possibly understand or imagine. All that was required of Ananias was to go and the spirit would do the rest of the work. It isn't up to us to do the saving. Only God can do that. What is required for us as believers and followers of Christ is to be open and available, to be willing to go, to share the love of Christ with anyone and everyone he chooses. And that's what I want you to understand today. The calling God has for you is to be a disciple who is making disciples.
the calling God has for you is to be a disciple who is making disciples. Now, when we look at the lives of Ananias and of Saul, there are two ways that we can do that. Two ways that we can live more fully in the call that Jesus has for us. The first comes when we are obedient to his will and his ways. Now, at first glance, this might sound like quite an opposite idea. How can a life be full when we're constrained by living by a set of rules? However, that's not what I found. When we're willing to follow Jesus in wherever we feel like he's calling us to go, in whatever we feel like he's calling us to do, we have to be prepared to experience a life that's filled with abundance. I found that some of the most joyful, the most fruitful, the most fulfilling experiences of my life have come when I am serving. When I'm actively engaged in what I feel like God is calling me to do, I'm not living life regimented by a set of rules, but I'm living life in a way that it's designed to be lived, in a way that God designed it to be lived. I was 12 years old when I first felt called into ministry. My youth group had just returned from, from a mission trip and my youth pastor had asked me to share some of reflections of what I'd learned on the trip. I was nervous as I spoke into a microphone in the stuffy church gym filled with parents and supporters. I felt my voice shaking and my knees knocking and it wasn't exactly a prophetic or profound speech. But afterwards, as I was playing in the gym with my friends, probably pelting each other in the face with a dodgeball or something, I was startled when the senior pastor at our church came and tapped me on the shoulder. He said, Brett, I really appreciate your reflections on Deuteronomy and how God was teaching you to love him with your heart, mind, and strength. That was really well done. And for me, it was that small, insignificant conversation that he probably doesn't even remember that launched me on the path to full-time ministry and to serving and loving the local church. Over the years, that calling has grown and been shaped by conversations and by hours of prayer and studying scripture. But I believe it all started for me with one small step with what Eugene Peterson calls a long obedience in the same direction. When we're constantly trying to follow after Jesus, making small steps of obedience each day, it makes us more and more like him. And we find that Ananias is eventually obedient to the call that Jesus has placed in front of him. Luke tells us in Acts chapter nine, verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me to, to you so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Ananias was obedient to the direction that Jesus had placed on his life. And it led him to being used by God to play a part in a miraculous story that God was weaving. Which plays into my second piece of application for today's message. If we want to be a disciple who's making disciples, we must be actively ready to go wherever Jesus sends us. In each of these stories in the book of Acts, whether it's Simon the sorcerer, the Ethiopian eunuch, Saul of Tarsus, or Ananias, there's an immediate response to go upon hearing the gospel message. And that's striking to me. The second the scales fall from Saul's eyes, he got up and was baptized, ready to be used in the mission God had for him. If we want to be disciples who are making disciples, 
If you want to be a disciple who's making disciples, you must be ready to go with the same boldness wherever and to whoever God is calling us. And when we do, we can give praise and glory to God who makes all things possible through his glorious grace. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for the story of Saul and for the story of Ananias. For two men in very different places in life and very different places in their walk with you. But two men who were used by you in equally powerful ways to spread your message and your gospel to the world. I pray that as we begin to think about next steps for us, that we be mindful of the people in our lives that need to hear from you, that need to hear of your message of love, redemption, and restoration. I pray that we can be people who can bring that message to the world, to our spheres of influence, to our friends, to our neighbors, to anyone we come in contact with. And when we do, we'll be careful to give you all the praise and all the glory. Amen.